This is a SCAG introduction to transportation demand management um, training session. And we're focusing on uh, Los Angeles County tonight, but if you're from, if you're in another county, um, I think we'll have plenty of relevant information for you as well. This is a um, introductory session, as I mentioned, but keep an eye out in the new year in 2022, we're gonna be doing uh, six deep dive sessions into specific transportation demand management topics. Um, so keep an eye out for those. We'll send out more details um, here in the coming months, but those will be taking place as kind of a, a second step. If this is the 101 course, if this is TDM 101, those will be uh, TDM 201 uh, coming up in 2022. Well, with that, um, we're two minutes past the hour. We'll hope some more folks will be uh, trickling in, but we're really grateful um, that you're joining us this afternoon. We wanna be uh, super respectful of your time. So we'll go ahead and get started. This is the Los Angeles County, um, this is our third, uh, this is Los Angeles County third session. It's the third time um, we're gonna be doing one of these for Los Angeles County. And it's the Transportation Demand Management Introduction uh, Training Session. So we're really excited to have you. Um, I just wanna say welcome. We know you're super busy. You have a lot on, on your plate. And so um, we appreciate you taking a couple hours to spend with us to learn more about TDM. This is a Zoom session, um, as you're uh, probably well aware, um, but we're not doing a webinar. It's just a regular Zoom meeting, which means you will have the ability to mute and unmute yourself um, and, and share your thoughts verbally. We're gonna ask that everyone stay uh, muted for the time being, um, but we'll go ahead and, and call on you when that time is appropriate. We're also gonna be using the chat functionality. So if you wouldn't mind opening up that chat window um, and getting ready, we're gonna ask a couple of questions um, uh, for you about that. We're also closed captioning this um, event. So if you uh, have trouble understanding what I'm saying, uh, go ahead and turn on those closed captions. You can hit those three dots in, inside of Zoom and it'll transcribe what I'm saying. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to Lorianne from SCAG to give us a quick update on um, what's going on on the SCAG front. So Lorianne, uh, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mason. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Lorianne Asturis. I'm with the, uh, I'm an assistant regional planner here at SCAG. Um, and just before today's training, I'd like to share some information about our ongoing SB 379, General Plan Safety Element Technical Assistance Program. Um, this is a joint effort between SCAG's local information services team and the Sustainable and Resilient Development Department. Just a little uh, background about LIST. Uh, the purpose of the team is to coordinate, plan, and develop a system to link SCAG's value-added products, such as our data and applications, to help address local information needs, uh, deliver technical assistance, and provide an opportunity for local staff to offer feedback on SCAG products to facilitate better collaboration both uh, regionally and locally. Um, our current focus for LIST is providing general plan technical assistance uh, under topics such as housing, EJ, and safety element updates, and in particular, uh, safety element updates as related to Senate Bill 379. Um, a bit of background on the bill itself. Uh, it was passed in 2015 and built upon previous legislation related to flood and fire. Uh, it applies to all cities and counties in California and requires climate adaptation and resilience strategies to be incorporated into general plan safety elements by January 1st, 2022. Um, what are the statutory requirements? Um, there are three components for SB 379. Uh, first off, uh, conducting a vulnerability assessment. Uh, secondly, development of a set of adaptation and resilience goals. And thirdly, development of a set of feasible implementation measures. And so just some background on LIST and SB 379. Um, in order to help support meeting the requirements of the spill, uh, SCAG is providing one-on-one -on -one safety element technical assistance. Uh, these trainings focus on meeting the bill's requirements and walking staff through the SB 379 compliance curriculum, which we developed this past summer. Um, it also includes a walkthrough of SCAG's adaptation planning resources from our regional adaptation framework, um, as well as showcasing state resources and some additional 
risk and vulnerability assessment data and mapping resources. Um, trainings are being held on an ongoing basis uh, through the January 1st uh, deadline and following it. And so if you're interested, uh, please reach out to list at skag.ca.gov. Um, and that's it on my end. I'll pass it over to Tom from SCAG. Thank you. Um, so uh, Nathan, if you wanna share again. Um, yeah, so uh, I am Tom Bellino. I'm a planner at SCAG and I am kind of the former <laughs> uh, SCAG project manager uh, for this project. Um, we had a reorganization of our planning team and uh, my colleague Steve is now the new uh, SCAG project manager. Um, a little bit of background on this project. Um, in August 2019, uh, uh, Steve and our, our consultant partners at STEER uh, completed the TDM strategic plan and it included um, a whole bunch of recommendations for programs that SCAG could implement uh, to increase the prevalence and effectiveness of TDM in the region. And one of those high priority recommendations was to conduct TDM trainings um, around the, the region um, to sort of maybe uh, bridge some of those startup costs that some low resource communities may face, um, or you know, that they may find insurmountable when they're uh, thinking about starting up a TDM program uh, from scratch or maybe expanding the ones that they already have. Um, and so the, the thought process is that if we can get people introduced to, in this case, TDM as a concept in general, and then down the line uh, in the spring, uh, specific types of TDM, um, those programs will be easier for local jurisdictions and employers and institutions to implement. And so like Nathan said, um, this is the last training of these sort of TDM 101 sessions where we'll introduce you to sort of the basics of TDM. And then in uh, early 2022, we will have another set of trainings that will uh, focus on specific types of TDM or specific communities that can be served by TDM. Um, and I'll turn it over to Stephen to just uh, say a few words and then we'll get started. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. As Tom said, I'm the new project manager of this project and I'm a transit and rail planner at SCAG and I have a lot of TDM experience as well and was a uh, project manager of the TDM strategic plan. So um, with that, we, we can get started and, and uh, anyone wants to reach out to me for any reason, uh, we'll have my contact information at the, at the end today. I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. Um, we really appreciate all your guys' work on this project, and we're excited to kick off uh, this training. The last bit of housekeeping is we just want to get a feel for who's here today. So if you wouldn't mind um, going into the Zoom chat um, and typing three things, type your name, uh, what organization you're with or who you're representing this afternoon, and your job title or your responsibilities, something to give us an idea of what you do there. Um, we're all about networking and promoting TDM partnerships. So if you're interested in putting your email address or your LinkedIn profile so that people can connect with you, um, you can do that as well. So we just wanna get a feel for who's here tonight. Go ahead and type that in the chat. Um, my name is Nathan Pope. I'll introduce myself. I'm a consultant at the consultancy firm Steer. Um, we've been doing uh, transportation demand management work here in Southern California uh, for many years now and helped out with the SCAG uh, TDM strategic plan. So. Um, we're really excited to be uh, continuing the work of uh, TDM in Southern California. I'm joined tonight by uh, a couple of colleagues who are going to be helping out. Um, that includes, uh, includes Pooja Thomas Patel um, and Leslie Scott, who is going to be helping me to facilitate the chat. And so I'll go over to Leslie right now. Um, and Leslie, if you wouldn't mind, who, who do we have with us? Um, who's joining us at the training tonight? Okay, Nathan, so today's uh, winners for the TDM <laughs> uh, session is that we, joking, all joking aside, I'm glad to see a colleague of mine, Devin Deming from LA Metro, as well as Gustavo from UCI. And we've got um, uh, Caitlin from Culver City and Lori from Santa Monica. 
And let's see, Pat from LA County. That's just a just a sort of quick listing. Uh, there are some others that are coming in, but gives you an idea that we've got a lot of city and county and metro folks with us today. So I hand it back to you, Nathan. Wonderful. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you all for being here. We're going to be talking about several things tonight, and we've kind of broken it into two parts. The first part of our training is going to be the what, the why, the who, and the where of TDM, all the basics that we need to know uh, to build that foundation of transportation demand management. That's in part one. We're going to take a, about a 10-minute break around the hour mark, and then we're going to come back and do part two. And in part two, um, it's really how. How do we create a TDM plan? How do we create a TDM program? We're going to run through a whole bunch of strategies, and then we're going to take some time to jump into some breakout rooms, do some structured discussion around a worksheet we've created um, to, to really stimulate um, some conversation and to really hopefully uh, let you have some actionable next steps into implementing TDM or expanding your existing TDM program. So I'm going to ask now if we go back to the chat, um, is there anything specific uh, that you'd hope to learn today? Is there one or two things you really wanted us to touch on that you're hoping to learn today. If you wouldn't mind just typing those in the chat box, we can try to make sure that we cover those um, as we go through the training. We're gonna start super basic. What is TDM? What is transportation demand management? That's the first question we're gonna ask. And I like to answer that question with another question, which is why can't we all just drive by ourselves? Why can't we just for every single trip that we make, hop in the car, uh, hop in a car or a truck and go by ourselves across um, all industries? And so, I kind of break down this answer into three categories. The first being congestion and traffic, one of the reasons why we can't just all drive alone. Um, we've seen the, the impacts of uh, traffic and congestion here in Los Angeles County, as I'm sure you are all quite aware. Um, pollution and air quality, we also have our history of smog here in Southern California, um, and we know the impacts that um, uh, emissions from vehicles can have on our climate. And then health and well being. Um, it's not healthy to be uh, sitting in a car for multiple hours per day. It's not physically healthy and it's not mentally healthy. So um, three reasons why we can't just drive alone, traffic, pollution, health. Also, cars take up a lot of space. Here's a little graphic with 200 people, how much space they take up um, when they're cars, how much space they would take up if they were all on bikes, how much space they would take up if they were all on buses, and how much space they would all take up if they were on a train. You can see here, um, it's a lot of space for cars. So cars are super efficient at a lot of things, but one thing they're not efficient at is space, um, especially when there's just one person per car. Um, and here in Los Angeles County, where we're very built out, where we're not able to expand roads and we don't really want to expand roads, we have to think how we can efficiently use our transportation system. Cars also take up a lot of space when we're not using them. Car storage or parking um, takes up a huge amount of space. This is a quick visualization that gives you an idea of the 18 million parking spaces that are in LA County uh, in 2010 at least. Um, that's 3.3 parking spaces for every car um, in LA County. And this is just 2010 numbers. We've definitely built more parking since then. Um, it costs about $27,000 to build, to build a parking structure. It costs about $27,000 per parking space um, to build one in LA County. And it's an extra 10 grand if you wanna build an underground structure. So it's incredibly expensive to build parking as well. And it takes up a huge amount of space. Cars spend most of their time not being driven, not being used. So um, looking at some of the inefficiencies of the cars from a space perspective, uh, we can start, start thinking about how we can use our transportation system more efficiently. And LA County is gonna grow. Um, we're looking here at LA County's growth um, from 2016 to 2045, going from 10 million people to um, 11 million people. Um, and how are we gonna move these people around, uh, get them where they need to go, get them to their jobs, to, to their errands, to their uh, healthcare, how are we gonna move them around um, using the existing transportation system that we have and the existing space that we have? So this is where TDM comes in. And I wanna see, kind of get an idea of what people think transportation demand management means, TDM. Is there one word that comes to mind when you hear TDM? If you wouldn't mind uh, jumping that, dumping that into the chat now, um, just to get an idea of where people are at with TDM. If, if you had to pick one word that describes TDM or something TDM adjacent, what would that be? And go ahead and type those into the, into the chat box now. We're gonna start defining TDM now. And I have two definitions of what TDM is. The first one here is transportation demand management, TDM, is the use of strategies to inform and encourage travelers, people getting around, to maximize efficiency, reduce congestion, and lower emissions. So, Altogether, transportation demand management is the use of strategies to inform and encourage travelers to maximize the efficiency of our transportation system, reduce uh, congestion and traffic, 
and lower those transportation emissions. We're trying to do those three things, maximize, reduce, and lower emissions. How do we do that? Well, transportation demand management seeks to reduce the demand for travel, how much we wanna manage the demand for transportation uh, by reducing the total amounts of trips, consolidating those trips, or shifting trips. So reducing trips, that means um, overall, the amount of trips that people are taking, we're trying to reduce that amount so people don't have to make as many trips. Consolidating trips. So we want to take, if someone was going to take uh, one trip to the grocery store and then one trip to um, work, maybe they can take that trip to the grocery store and then go straight to work or, or vice versa. Or shifting trips. Um, shifting trips to different modes. And that's something we're going to spend a lot of time on tonight, talking about shifting trips to different transportation modes, alternative transportation modes. When I say that, I mean basically anything that isn't driving by yourself is an alternative transportation modes. Um, these modes are typically more um, efficient on our transportation infrastructure, and they're more sustainable in their um, emissions. So uh, it could be uh, rail, trains, bus, carpool, vanpool, bike, walk, any of these other transportation um, options are uh, what we're calling alternative transportation options. We're really trying to get people to shift their behavior from driving to one of these alternatives. If there's one word that you take away from this training that you think of when you hear the word, the term transportation demand management, I hope it's options. Really, we're trying to um, give people more options for how they get around and making sure that they um, have access to the best option for every trip that they make. I do have one quick slide here on COVID and the impacts that the pandemic has had on how we get around. Um, really at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really focused on those essential trips only. And we saw that huge drop in uh, travel demand. You can see here in this chart um, pulled from Apple Maps and the amount of people requesting directions through Apple Maps. You can see um, the walking, the driving and the transit lines really dropping there in uh, March, April um, 2020. And then they've rebounded differently. So. Um, the orange and pink lines are walking and driving, and those have rebounded more quickly. And the purple line uh, is transit, and you can see here in Los Angeles County, transit has been slower to recover, um, but it's back, back getting closer to that, um, that baseline. So um, the pandemic has definitely had us rethink how we get around, and it's also had us rethink how we use the street. Um, we've seen the LA Fresco, the, the on-street dining program, um, where we're, we're using uh, the street space for um, economic recovery and expanding opportunities for uh, restaurants and businesses. We've also seen a huge increase in teleworking um, in the amount of folks who, have to, who don't have to, to travel to work anymore. They can do so from home, so therefore reducing that trip. We've also seen some caution, as we can see in the purple line here, of, of people returning to using shared modes like transit or carpooling. Um, but on the flip side, we've seen a big increase in uh, biking and active transportation, and particularly um, e-bikes, so we've seen a boom around that as well. So um, COVID-19 has definitely changed uh, a lot of how we think about transportation and a lot of how people get around. I'm gonna be saying TDM strategies, transportation demand management strategies and programs a lot tonight. And really these are your tools. These are the different pieces of the puzzle that you can put together to have a successful uh, TDM program. So um, these are the buckets of categories that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, we have our education and marketing TDM strategies, our incentive and facilitation TDM strategies, our infrastructure and system upgrade strategies, our parking strategies, and our supportive policy strategies. We're going to really deep dive into each of these categories in the second half of the presentation, but I wanted to, to put these in your head now. These are the different tools that we have in our toolbox um, to help solving some of these issues around um, uh, congestion, air quality, um, and emissions. And it wouldn't be a transportation presentation if we didn't have a whole bunch of three letter acronyms, three word acronyms that we're shortening up. I'm gonna do my best throughout this presentation to uh, expand and say the full term. Um, but if I do slip up, here are those definitions. We already talked about the first one, TDM, Transportation Demand Management. We're trying to manage that demand for transportation. SOV is single occupancy vehicle. It's just another way of saying someone driving by themselves. Um, you can think of high, occup high occupancy vehicles being the opposite, and maybe you see that on, on, the, on the freeways, the HOV lane. TMAs and TMOs are transportation management associations or transportation management organizations. These are um, uh, organizations that are in charge of really implementing transportation demand management strategies and programs in a specific geography, whether it be a city, a corridor, a business park. Um, TMAs and TMOs are really focused on a, a specific community and helping to provide transportation options to that community. The next one is ETC, Employee Transportation Coordinator. 
Um, and ETC or is what we've um, come to, to name the person here in Southern California at an employer, um, at a business who's in charge of the uh, commuter program. So getting their employees to work, knowing what their benefits and options are um, and, and submitting any um, regulation requirements. They're the, they're the point of contact there. So you might hear the term ETC, that's Employer Transportation Coordinator. And the last one on here is VMT, Vehicle Miles Travel. This is a newer term that we're using here in Southern California to measure the impacts of uh, different projects on our transportation system. It's just the vehicle miles traveled, the sum of that, and we'll go more into the definitions um, here later in the presentation. So I have a, a, a tough quiz question here now, if anyone's brave enough to define what transportation demand management means in your own words. Um, if anyone, I think it's great to, if you, if you have a pen and paper in front of you, go ahead and write that down um, and it'll really help ingrain what your definition of TDM is, it's a good learning tool. If anyone's brave enough to type it in the chat, we'd love to hear your definition um, as well. Um, and Leslie, I'll go back to the chat. Did we have anybody mention anything on our previous questions or if any on our previous chat questions? Or has yes. anyone had a question of their own? Yes, we do. We have Caitlin from Culver City who's mentioned that the city will be doing an update to their transportation demand management, their TDM ordinance. So again, um, some you know folks are a little further along than others and Culver City has a very good program uh, for transportation demand management. And then Devin Deming, who's been in the TDM field for a very long time, talked about efficiencies. And we do know that she's got a strong program for uh, bus, pass, bus passes, both for the colleges and the schools, which is all a part of TDM. And then I just wanted to mention, a, a, you gave a definition about employee transportation coordinator, coordinators, ETCs. And so Gustavo is here again with us as an ETC for Irvine. So, that, so uh, that's what we've got going on um, in the chat. Great, um, I love that uh, definition, uh, Devin, or that if, that if you had to distill it down to one word, we're trying to maximize the efficiency of our transportation system. Um, I think that's a really good definition. Well, we talked about the what, now let's talk about the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we having this training? Um, we talked about some of the problems, but what can TDM, Transportation Demand Management, bring to the table? I've kind of broken it into three categories of the goals and the benefits of Transportation Demand Management. The first are the economic benefits. Um, if we can solve some of these problems, um, we can help decrease congestion, we can reduce um, time wasted in traffic, um, if we, we can reduce our parking and infrastructure costs and then spend those money, spend those savings on, on other things as well. Um, for the environmental side of things, we can reduce our emissions, help to curb uh, climate change and improve our air quality. And then from the social side of things, um, we can help get people out, uh, to, to really maximize their efficiency of their time, give them greater health and well-being, get them uh, out of traffic into to different options and to promote more livable and uh, social communities. So three um, kind of big categories of why we're promoting transportation demand management, those economic benefits, those environmental benefits, and those social benefits. But how do we measure these benefits? That's what we're gonna talk about next is measurements and metrics. Um, we wanna talk about outputs versus outcomes when we're doing our measurements. Outputs being our, our actions, what we do, and outcomes are being what the result of those actions are. Um, and metrics are super important because they're going to help us uh, justify our TDM strategies, show that return on investment, help us secure more funding, um, improve the program over time, and hopefully integrate it into the larger um, processes that we're, we're putting together. To get us started on metrics, we have um, a couple of key metrics that, we're, that we are going to talk about. In this little pyramid here, um, we're kind of looking at different scales, different geographies, and what metrics make the most sense at different uh, scales. We start at the top, we can talk about AVR, that's average vehicle ridership, and we'll define what that is in the next slide. It's basically just a ratio of, um, that we can use to quickly get an idea of how much cars, how much uh, traffic a specific site is creating. Um, also a bit at the corridor community level. If we go to more of the city, getting closer to the regional level, we're looking at things like uh, program registrations, um, events, um, and then if we zoom out more, we're looking at ridership, whether transit, bus, uh, bike share, um, looking at those numbers. 
Um, VMT, we talked about that, vehicle miles traveled. Um, that's something we can look at more at that county, regional level, and then just program signups. Who's participating in things? So there's a couple of high level metrics. I said AVR, and I said I would define that. AVR is average vehicle ridership, and we have a little graphic here to define what that means. Average vehicle ridership is a really simple ratio. It's just the number of people divided by the number of cars. Um, and we typically use it to um, really understand how people are getting to a certain location. Um, the example, the, the classic example is an employer and how employees are getting to work. So um, in this example, we have an employer who has seven employees, seven people coming to work, these yellow um, stick figures up here. And then those seven people, how they got to work is in the bottom half of the denominator. Two of them drove by themselves, four of them got in two two-person carpools, and one of them um, biked to work that day. In order to calculate the average vehicle ridership, that AVR, we're just going to take the total number of people, seven, divided by the total number of cars, in this case four, and we get an AVR, an average vehicle ridership, of 1.75. Um, AVR, typically the higher number we consider better in the TDM world. That means you're using fewer cars per person to get people to the, to the site. Um, an AVR of two means that for every two people coming to the site, there's only one car. And I think that's a, a really uh, good target for a lot of folks. An AVR of one means that for every one person coming to the, to the site, there's one car coming to the site on average. So that's average vehicle ridership. Another metric that we like to use is mode share, um, which is just the different percentages um, of how people are getting to a certain location or, or getting around. So this is a, you know, a very idealized model, but we said, um, this, you know, the same amount of people drive to work, walk to work, bike to work, transit, take transit to work or carpool to work. It doesn't have to be for work. It can be for how they're getting, uh, getting around their community, but just looking at those different percentages and how they compare and how they change over time. So two metrics that we like to start off with, which are average vehicle ridership and mode share. Um, I'm going to do a talk a little bit more about some other metrics. On the left here, we have some of those um, outputs from different TDM strategies and programs. These can be things like program enrollment, program registrations, just the number of registered people um, who are using your different uh, TDM programs. Um, you know, 125 enrollees out of total 400 employees or something like that. Attendees, the number of people who are coming to an event, like maybe a TDM training. Um, we can use that as one of our output metrics. We had 125 people RSP or something like that. Outcomes, on the other hand, is what, are, what is the, what is um, the results of the things that we're doing? We talked about mode share and mode split. Mode, uh, sh mode shift is just the change in those percentages over time. So we went from 25% people taking transit, 10% of people biking, and 55% of people driving alone. Um, and then maybe we do our intervention and we look again, and 30% of people are taking transit, and 45% uh, of people are driving alone. We can see that change over time with our mode split. Average vehicle ridership, we talked about that. Just the number of people divided by the number of vehicles arriving at a specific site. Um, if we have 100 people coming to the site and 80, of, 80 cars arrive at the site, that's an AVR of 100 divided by 80 to get 1.25. And then vehicle miles traveled, that's um, one that we mentioned, is a, a newer metric here in Southern California. Uh, VMT is just calculated by the sum of the number of miles traveled by each vehicle in the, in the scenario that we're measuring. Uh, vehicle miles traveled per capita is a, is a common um, example of that metric. To give an example of that, we're looking at this Connect SoCal and they're looking at how um, vehicle miles traveled in Southern California are gonna be changing uh, from 2016 to uh, 2045. Um, let's zoom in here on Los Angeles County. Um, you can see here that the daily VMT for 2022 is, excuse me, 2016 is 22.2 .2, um, miles per capita is what SCAG's uh, model is saying. And then they're looking at 2045 and that number is going down um, to 20.4 VMT uh, per capita is the goal. How do we, wh why do we, what do we do with these numbers? Once we have these metrics, what do we do with them? How is it, how do we translate these into useful um, terms that we can then share with the general public or, or help to justify our program, show that return on investment? We can really show the, the change in the mode share, that mode split over time is a really compelling number. Um, we can translate that into the vehicle trips that we've reduced or the amount of walking, biking, transit, carpool, other modes that we've increased, the new the, the increase in that. On the environmental side, we can say the um, car, 
the carbon or the CO2 that we've reduced or the amount of gasoline that we've saved are on the ga engagement side. We can talk about uh, attendance or participation, um, how many people are engaging with our, with our different programs. To measure these things, to, to really collect the data um, can, be a, can be a challenge, um, but there's a lot of new tools out there. Traditionally, we rely a lot on surveys, asking people how they get around. Um, you can see this example on the right is a commuter survey. Um, that's asking folks how they got to work um, for a five-day period. On um, day one, they said that they took the bus, and then here it's asking on day two, it says that they telecommute um, or they worked from home, uh, but they have a drop-down menu of options. And then we can collect that data um, from that survey and have a good idea for, of how um, people are getting around. We also have uh, transportation um, mode data in the census and the American Community Survey. So that's a place if you're looking at more regional um, level to get a good sense of how people are getting around. Trip tracking programs can be um, analog where you're asking people to keep a diary of how they get around um, for a set period of time, or they can be more automatic now with apps and technology that will automatically track how people are getting around. And uh, with, your, with their permission, um, you can collect that data. Um, and then program participation, we can kind of look at things like ridership or involvement in our TDM programs to, to collect some of that data. Some more um, advanced tools for forecasting and, and measuring these impacts are the TDM uh, ROI, Return on Investment Calculator, from Mobility, Mobility Labs, where they can really translate um, some of the uh, TDM strategies into very specific metrics. Then you have some other uh, more advanced models like the TRIMS model and the EPA computer mode um, also give you some more advanced results as well. We also have a lot of uh, technology out there that's really making some of this data um, collection a bit easier. There's um, things like trip tracking and trip planning tools. This is an example from uh, uh, Colorado that I just wanted to share where people can get um, different transportation options, but they can also track their commutes too to provide that data um, to, to the, uh, the TDM provider. Um, and then we have uh, some other things that these technology platforms can do from incentive management to carpool matching to uh, parking management as well. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be rattling on about all these different uh, topics. We, we really hope that you'll um, type some things in the chat if you have specific questions. Um, if you want some clarifications or if you'd like me to elaborate on something, please go ahead and uh, type those into the chat. And um, when we get to a question slide, we can go through and review and make sure we, we've answered all those questions. I didn't see any um, pop-ups that we had in any new chat, so I'm gonna push forward, but go ahead and um, add those chats as they come up, add those questions as they come up to the chat. So that's kind of the why and the metrics behind transportation demand management. Now we're gonna get to the who. Who implements transportation demand management strategies um, and uh, what are some examples? So here in Southern California, um, I have my big old circle hierarchy here. We have the state and their TDM strategy. We zoom in more to Southern California and we have SCAG and their transportation demand management um, plan, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Zooming in a bit closer, we have the air quality management district. We have the South Coast Air Quality Management District here in uh, Los Angeles County and they have their TDM program. Regional governments, transit operators and cities can also implement TDM um, as can sites, whether it be a residential building, an employer, um, or any kind of specific uh, site that's going to be having a lot of travel around it can also implement TDM. And then way down at the bottom, that little yellow um, circle says individuals. We're all trying to influence the behavior um, of the individual, help um, to shift their behavior from driving alone to something else, whether it be um, not taking that trip, consolidating that trip, or shifting that trip to a different transportation. Plan. We're all trying to influence the individual. Other organizations that um, typically implement TDM strategies are uh, schools, universities, hospitals, business parks, um, employers, residential properties, um, anyone where you have a, a large amount of people traveling in and out. Um, transportation management organizations, we'll talk more about, um, and nonprofits are also uh, organizations that implement TDM. We talked about SCAG and Tom mentioned their um, transportation demand management strategic plan. Um, this is a plan that was completed in 2019 that's looking at policies and programs to increase that efficiency that we talked about for the transportation system, reducing those vehicle miles traveled um, and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions through short, medium and long term initiatives. Um, and it has specific performance measurements and metrics. And I, I highly encourage you all to uh, check it out if you're interested in TDM. 
you'll be sent a link to it at the end of this training. You'll also be sent uh, an attachment that comes with that, that is the TDM toolkit. Um, and the SCAG TDM toolkit is full of um, different TDM strategies and how to implement them. And we'll talk a little bit more about it um, later, but these are kind of what that, that toolkit looks like. You'll be getting a copy of this um, later and I hope you do a deep dive and look at what each of these strategies um, can offer. Some key players in um, Los Angeles County who are implementing TDM. Um, we have uh, SC uh, AQMD, the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Um, we'll talk more about what they're doing. Uh, LA Metro is doing a lot around uh, transportation demand management. Maybe we'll put um, Devin on the spot and ask her some of the stuff that she's doing. Um, and then cities, there's a lot of cities who have uh, transportation demand management ordinances. Um, we also have a bunch of transportation management organizations and associations who are implementing TDM strategies. Uh, Warner Connects and Warner Center, BTMO for Burbank, Mo Glendale, the Pasadena Transportation Management Organiza Association, uh, Commute um, 90067 in Century City, the Go Samo TMO in Santa Monica, uh, Compass in Playa Vista, and Fast LA in downtown Los Angeles are all geography specific um, TDM um, programs that are really focusing on certain audiences and helping them to choose the best transportation option for them. We also have a lot of developers, property managers, schools. Um, employers who are implementing TDM as well. So this is just a, this is a taste, it's not comprehensive. I'll zoom in on one of these here just to give you an example, and that's the South Coast Air Quality Management District. They have a, uh, a rule um, that's a requirement of all employers in Southern California with 250 or more employees, and they're asking them to mitigate their commuter trips, uh, the trips that are coming from their employees and the emissions that are coming from their employees' commutes they're requiring the employers to offset those emissions by um, doing one of three things, either paying into a regional fund, purchase, purchasing emission reduction credits, or submitting an employee commute reduction program. Um, and the employee re commute reduction program um, is really a, a menu of strategies that employers can um, choose from to provide at their work site to encourage their employees um, and to, to help incentivize their employees for, to get to the work site without um, driving by themselves. So rule 2202 is something that I know a lot of our employers have probably heard about. Um, it's really a good starting point for many folks on TDM in Southern California. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we, we can definitely discuss more if people are interested. So I'll pause right there. That's just an example of um, what's going on here in Southern California around transportation demand management right now. And there's quite a bit. Um, I'll pause here now before um, we move on and ask if there was any questions, Leslie. Yeah, so Nathan, there are some questions coming from Patricia at LA County, and I think uh, it's a, actually a good segue because you, you are going to be providing us with more specific examples of what she's inquiring mostly about, uh, say, for example, school districts having TDM and TDM for the county. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're going to be able to cover that, Patricia. Yeah, great questions. Um, we're definitely gonna have a lot of examples here in the second half of the presentation. I'm gonna talk about specific strategies and then give examples of those strategies as well. We won't cover every TDM strategy, but we'll have a good start. Um, and then there's kind of questions about a uh, school district and there are uh, school districts definitely have TDM strategies. Some of them have TDM uh, plans in place, more comprehensive things, um, but a lot of them partner with uh, other organizations for implementing um, some, some different uh, programs for encouraging their uh, employees to get to, to work without driving by themselves, but also getting the students there more efficiently. Um, Devin, I don't know if you can see where I'm going, but I'm wondering if you can, uh, I can put Devin Demings on the spot from Metro to talk about um, what they're doing around uh, schools and um, transit and getting, getting folks to our LA County schools um, without requiring them to, without needing them to, to drive by themselves. Devin, are you able to, to chat about that? Yeah, sure. Hi, Nathan. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I oversee the Fairless System Initiative, and we just launched our first phase uh, for K-12 districts and community colleges. And so in those programs, the school districts can pay for K-12, they can pay $3 a student and get unlimited rides for the whole year on Metro. And right now there's about eight other participating transit agencies, and that number is growing. So there's no, like some cities have 
requirements on what time kids can ride free. We don't, we have, it's unlimited. They can ride anytime to and from school, after school, evenings, weekends, holidays, summer, everything. Um, so that's a brand new program that just started. And then I also still oversee the employer pass program. And so that's a program where employers can distribute passes to all of their employees and then just pay for the trips that are used or they can pay a flat rate for the whole year depending on what the employer chooses. So we have a lot of options at Metro. Great options for um, large organizations like schools or employers to buy bulk transit passes and then provide those to their, their students or their employees. Um, and then those folks don't have to, um, they have a free transit pass and they don't have to drive. They can uh, not make, uh, increase our traffic or increase our, our uh, emissions as well. So yeah, I, I can put some links in the chat as well if you want. That'd be great. Thanks, Devin. We really appreciate it. Um, I don't see any other questions. So we're going to move forward and talk about where TDM is located, uh, where TDM is implemented. And I have one specific case study that I'm going to show you. Um, the case study is the city of Santa Monica. Um, and they've been doing a lot around transportation demand management for several years now. Um, just to give you an idea of what kind of a, a mature TDM program looks like here in Southern California. City of Santa Monica, as I'm sure you're aware, um, 90,000 residents plus another 90,000 people during the day commuting into the city, um, 8 million visitors annually pre-pandemic, um, a lot of challenges around uh, traffic, especially during the peak periods. Um, they also looked at this chart here and looked at where their emissions were coming from. They're uh, really um, concerned about uh, their climate emissions and the emissions you can see, oh, what's down there? 64% of their emissions um, were coming from vehicle transportation. So they really wanted to focus on that for their climate um, initiatives as well. So they wanted to proactively manage congestion, uh, reduce autom automobile dependency and enhance transportation choice, make sure that people have more options for getting around Santa Monica and reduce that um, SOV mode share, that single occupancy vehicle mode share, shift, shift people from driving by themselves to other transportation options. So what did the city do? They did a lot of things, but I wanted to highlight two. Um, the first is a TVM ordinance, a transportation demand management ordinance that requires employers in Santa Monica with 50 or more employees to have an employee transportation coordinator who's trained, conduct an annual survey to gather that data um, of how people are getting around, and then create a, create a, a plan for encouraging sustainable commutes. So um, the city has a, a menu of different strategies that employers can pick from, and then they, they pick some uh, 15 different strategies that they implement um, to encourage their employees for, to get to work without driving. Um, and then they submit uh, uh, that all together in a plan and a little fee goes along that to, with that as well. Um, and that's for employers with 50 or more employees in Santa Monica. That's kind of more on the stick side of things, on the carrot side of things, on the encouragement. They also created the Transportation Management Organization. Uh, it's called the Go SAMO TMO, the Go SAMO Transportation Management Organization. Um, and that supports uh, not only employers, but residents and visitors um, for all their alternative transportation, their sustainable transportation options and needs. So it has the, they do marketing campaigns, um, materials, educational events, um, and rides to get people to try these different transportation options, let people try to ride the bus um, as a group, uh, ride the train as a group, understand how it works, partner with uh, the local transit agencies um, to get more people on board. And then they do the advocacy um, work as well to encourage and uh, advocate for more transportation options, and build capacity um, in the community. So um, more information if you're interested on the TMO at gosamotmo.org. Um, but you can really see here the city of Santa Monica kind of did a twofold approach where they have the ordinance, which is more of a requirement, uh, more of a stick, or the and the TMO, which really is the, the carrot and encouraging people to, to try these different transportation options. So I'll pause again for questions. Um, let's see, did anything come in since last I last I uh, looked? Nathan, nothing's come in, just the links that Devin has posted for both the school as well as the employers in the chat. Great. Well, that is the end of the first half of our presentation. Um, let's see, it's about 4.46 right now, 4.47. So um, let's go ahead and take our break. Let's come back in 10 minutes, go ahead, stretch your legs, um, get a drink of water, um, and we'll come back at uh, four, what time is it right now, 4.46? We'll come back at 4.57. Thanks, you guys, so much. If you have questions, type them in the chat. Otherwise, um, we'll get going again in about 10 minutes. Thanks so much. 
So as we're coming back, I think it's super um, important when we're learning about new topics to recap and reinforce what we learned. So what did we go through so far? We talked about the what, the why, the who, and the where is, ED, is um, TDM implemented. We talked about kind of our definition up here. TDM seeks to reduce the demand for travel by um, reducing the amount of trips, consolidating trips, or shifting trips, shifting trips to other alternative transportation modes. We talked about um, some of the metrics behind uh, why TDM measures, um, why TDM matters, and the measurements that prove it around uh, reducing congestion, um, promoting uh, sustainable um, emissions reductions and air quality improvements, um, and helping that about well being. We talked about uh, AVR. Um, that average vehicle ridership metric that it comes up a lot in TDM, the people divided by cars. We talked about mode split and mode shift, um, the percentage of people taking different transportation modes and how that changes over time. Um, and we talked about VMT, vehicle miles traveled. Um, we also talked about who's implementing TDM. We talked about SCAG's uh, transportation demand management strategic plan. We talked about uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District and their rule 2202 for employers. Um, we talked about all the different transportation management organizations and associations in Southern California. Um, but really, I think the, the key definition here uh, as we move forward is transportation demand management is all about options, making sure have, people have different transportation options um, for every trip that they're taking. So that's the quick recap. Um, let's see, do we have any new questions in the chat? Nope, I don't see any. So we'll go ahead and move on to the second half of the presentation now, which is the how. How are we implementing TDM strategies? And we, we talked about these five toolboxes um, that we have that have our different tools in them, um, our different TDM strategies. And so they, we group them into these five categories. They are uh, education and marketing strategies that are about distributing information about transportation options, incentive and facilitation strategies, which are encouraging people to use alternative transportation options, uh, infrastructure and system upgrades, which are making alternative transportation modes more competitive with driving by yourself, more um, pleasant and easy to use. Uh, parking strategies are kind of the flip side of that, where we're increase, increasing the, uh, the costs uh, to driving by yourself and to parking um, to make it more e uh, uh, reflective of what it actually costs. And then uh, transportation demand man management supportive policies is kind of adjacent policies and programs that um, really can support TDM efforts. So we're gonna do a deep dive into each of these categories. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to highlight again SCAG's TDM toolkit, which you'll be getting a copy of. And this is a, a selection of uh, pages from the toolkit. And only what the toolkit does is it, it focuses on individual transportation demand management strategies that you can use and kind of breaks them down. So on this telecommuting one, it has the implementers, um, what the benefits are, what the challenges are, um, how to measure it, who the stakeholders are, implementation tips, costs, and then a little example. And we have a whole bunch of different strategies. There's um, uh, a whole PDF that we're going to send at the end of this training that uh, talks about all these different strategies you can use. So if I don't um, talk about a strategy that you're interested in or you don't hear something um, today, do take a look at that TDM uh, toolbox toolkit that we'll send out um, that, that has all these different strategies in there. It really gives you a good starting point for implementing. If you do have all of these strategies, right, these hundreds of strategies, how do you, how do you pick which one to use? I have a couple of questions to help narrow it down at least um, that really can help you focus in on what strategies and tools make the most sense. The first one is just simply, what are your goals? Are you, you have specific goals around um, emissions reductions? Um, are you focusing on the, the climate change uh, aspect of this? Or are you more focused on the, the traffic reject, uh, congestion um, uh, portion where you're really trying to meet specific uh, traffic congestion, congestion goals? Um, or do you have other specific goals, air quality, um, uh, well-being, uh, performance, efficiency, what, what are your goals? And that'll help you choose specific TDM strategies. Along the same lines is who are your partners? Who's out there who has similar goals to you that you can work with to, to help make progress um, towards these goals? Uh, who already has a TDM program that you can um, build off of? Um, or who would be a good partner to uh, start something from scratch? At the same time, we want to think about who or what we can influence. Um, who, who's the target population for who we're trying to get there? Who are those individuals that we're trying to um, influence their behavior? 
whether it be um, if you're an employer, your, your target audience, uh, who you can influence is probably your employees, but maybe if you're a city or a municipality, it's the residents or it's the developers. Who are, who's your target audience? Who are you trying to influence? You also wanna think about the equity impact. So um, anytime we're, we're talking about transportation and getting people to try different transportation options, we gotta think about who's able to use those transportation options and how robust they are. Um, it could be that if we're trying to uh, encourage people to, to not drive by themselves, but some people um, can only drive, maybe they're differently abled and they're, they're only able to get around through driving. Um, we wanna make sure we're considering them when we're putting together our programs. Vice versa, there's plenty of folks who can't drive um, who aren't able to drive by themselves. So how can we make sure our programs are empowering them as well? And then what are your existing transportation options? What's your existing transportation infrastructure? This can really help you um, to start, uh, to find a place to start if you're, Really trying to get people to encourage people to bike, but you don't have safe biking infrastructure, maybe that's not the right place to start. Um, if you don't have um, uh, good transit service, maybe we're not really trying to promote transit. Um, maybe we're working to increase that transit service first before we start um, really looking to shift individual behavior. All of the strategies that we're talking about today are also potentially going to have some funding requirements or going to have some costs. So I wanted to highlight um, a couple of places that uh, we can find some funding for transportation demand management programs. At the federal level, we have uh, the congestion mitigation and air quality improvement, the CMAC uh, grants that are available along with FTA grants. Um, and then the surface transportation program is another place to look for funding. At the state level, we have the sustainable communities grants um, from the state of California. Um, there's revenue from the cap and trade program that can be leveraged for transportation demand management programs. And then there's the ATP, that active transportation program um, that's oftentimes been used to implement some TDM strategy. At the other, some other sources could be local sales tax or parking revenue. If you're at a city level or you're collecting parking revenue that can be reinvested into new transportation options or encouraging people to try different ways of getting around. Um, at the developer impact fees, a developer impact fees, so you could charge in a fee on new developments um, or other special grants, so smart cities grants, other things. Um, that are so, um, just some funding things to keep in mind as well. Okay, we're back to our categories. We're gonna do a deep dive um, now into each of these categories, starting with education and marketing strategies. Education and marketing strategies are strategies that encourage people to use alternative transportation options, right? We're just at the encouragement stage. Um, these strategies educate uh, people about their available transportation options, and they highlight the benefits of alternative uh, transportation options, highlight why, why it would be important to, to by these different options. I have a little relative scale that I've made down here at the bottom just to kind of compare these categories, um, the costs and the impacts. The costs and the impacts of these are relatively low, um, but it's a good place to start. From an implementation side of things, really any type of organization can implement these types of strategies, whether you're an employer, a property manager, um, a public agency, or a transportation provider, or a city, a municipality, regional government, anyone can really implement and the benefits are they increase the visibility of uh, alternative transportation options and, and TDM programs, and they can be produced at a variety of price points. These can be up a little cheap or more expensive as well. When we're talking about education and marketing in particular, getting the word out about something, trying to communicate with people, there's challenges around getting lost in the noise. There's so much email and advertising going on right now. How do you make a program like this stand out is one of the challenges. Um, and you really might have to pair this with another TDM strategy to make a significant impact. So what am I talking about? Here's uh, five examples of education and marketing strategies. Um, the simplest being just a marketing campaign, a marketing campaign um, to promote uh, non-SOV vehicles, so to promote those alternative transportation options, doing some kind of marketing initiative um, with the dispersion of printed material or digital material, um, email, social media, getting the word out about uh, biking, taking transit, microtransit, on-demand services, carpooling, getting the word out about these things. Um, another strategy is hosting educational events um, where we're providing um, an opportunity for um, folks to interact directly um, with uh, TDM experts, with the, with the experts on the transportation options, and really encouraging them to try um, different ways of getting around and try to encourage that behavior change. This, um, we're educating folks tonight. This is an educational TDM strategy that we're, we're using to reach trainings tonight. Wayfinding upgrades, so wayfinding signage. Um, just making simple adjustments to the signage for uh, people traveling without their cars, ensuring travelers can get where they need to go 
um, especially around like transit stations and transit hubs um, to provide uh, visibility for transit bicycle and pedestrian amenities and routes. Individual marketing is targeting specific populations um, with a marketing campaign. So uh, say we're trying to increase transit ridership, well, maybe um, we do a targeted individualized marketing campaign around folks who live next to the bus stops. Um, so uh, we can really target those folks who are around the bus stops to targeted communications with specific talking points um, and marketing geared specifically towards those groups. So really targeting our communications instead of doing mass messaging. And then the other, one other strategy that I'll highlight here is safe routes to schools. So working with schools and school districts to promote um, safe and active transportation options for students, um, helping to reduce the uh, traffic of parent drop-off, um, parent pickup, that kind of stuff. When we're talking about these education and marketing strategies, we're really talking about getting the word out, right? And we wanna talk about the different communication channels that we have, whether it be email, print material, bulletin boards, flyers, um, or more online with like web pages, whether it be an internal web page or a public facing web page, an external web page, um, advertisements, going to meetings where you know there's going to be a target audience, um, or more creative like billboards or bus wraps. There's more creative options as well. It all comes down to how does your target audience, the people you're trying to influence, and have their be and shift their behavior? Um, how does your target audience receive that information? What's the best channel for reaching them? Two quick examples of education and marketing strategies here in Los Angeles County. We have uh, LA Metro does their uh, bike month campaign where they're celebrating bicycling as a, a transportation option. This happens every May. Um, they have a promoting a, a bike anywhere day or bike anywhere week or, and bike to work day as well. Um, they host uh, online bike classes during COVID. It was online, but they also do physical ones pre-COVID, um, different events calendars that uh, other organizations can plug into and share their bike to work day celebration and just tips and tricks for, for getting back on the bike and um, making sure that biking is a, is a transportation option for folks. Another option is the City of Santa Monica wayfinding program, another example. This is a wayfinding strategy where um, they have provided window decals, little stickers that um, businesses can put in their windows that show the the distance and the time it would take to walk or bike to different attractions. So right, three minutes to the train station is what the one down there says. Um, and these signs remind travelers that uh, they might be able to comfortably walk to their destination. They don't have to drive. Um, it's just a three minute walk away or it's a five minute walk away. Um, letting people know how easy it is to get around uh, by foot. So that's a quick overview of our education and marketing strategies. Did any questions come in into the chat or any examples of things folks have used that they want to highlight that might qualify as an education and marketing strategy? Uh, so far, there haven't been any examples or questions. So I think we can move on to the next uh, subject. Great. Well, we really like examples of folks. If you're already doing something um, in one of these categories and you want to shout it out, we can see all the great work you're doing. We'd love to, to hear about it. But I'll move on to our next category, which is incentives and facilitation strategies. These are um, strategies that distribute information about transportation options. They provide effect or indirect incentive um, in exchange for folks changing their transportation behavior. Um, and they help increase access or experience to different transportation modes, alternative transportation modes for the first time. Um, we have slightly higher costs, but some more uh, significant impacts as well. Implementers can be really the same group. Really anyone can implement these strategies. And our benefits are that they're pretty easy to implement and they can have a larger impact, but oftentimes they require funding. Uh, it's another side of this thing. So uh, what am I talking about? I'm talking about things like carpool van pool coordination, um, coordinating commuters or other folks who are traveling in the same destination so they can pair up into a carpool or um, into a larger van pool, um, providing them access to a vehicle uh, as part of that as well. Telecommuting um, is a incentive and facilitation strategy where um, an employee uh, can work from home uh, rather than having to commute into the office. They don't have to can reduce the amount of trips they make. Flexible scheduling um, is the idea that folks uh, can maybe work longer days, um, but then not come into work as many hours, um, or they can come into work at different times to avoid rush hour or to meet the bus schedule. Um, uh, just giving folks more flexibility. 
direct incentives um, encourage employees to uh, try alternative transportation modes. Doesn't have to be employees. Encourages anyone to try alternative transportation modes uh, by providing rewards, um, typically financial rewards, uh, things like gift cards, entrance into a raffle, a prize drawing, something similar. Just uh, incentivizes them to, to try the ways of getting around. Subsidies, on the other hand, encourage um, folks to try alternative transportation modes by subsidizing the costs. So it could be a subsidized transit pass, or it could be a subsidized parking um, for carpoolers where they can pay um, a discount parking pass, um, just really helping to cover the cost of these alternative transportation modes. Then I have developing a TMA or TMO, those transportation management organizations, really creating that capacity, creating that organization that can implement these TDM strategies in a specific geography. So uh, creating one of these organizations is itself a TDM strategy. Um, I have a list kind of here, some of the different incentive examples, since incentives is a big part of these strategies. Um, they can be money, gift cards, um, raffles, prizes, but there can also be like feel good benefits, like um, you're the commuter of the month or really highlighting the health benefits or the um, climate benefits that you're, you're doing by changing these modes. Um, by changing how you get to get around. I want to zoom in to telecommuting and um, really talk about reducing trips with technology. We've seen this uh, over the past two years um, where teleworking, um, folks don't have to go into the office, they can do it from home, but then also e-government where you can, you don't have to go to city hall to get a permit, you can go online to get that same permit and reduce that, that trip as well. Same thing with telemedicine, where um, you don't have to go to the doctor's office, you can ring the doctor up on Zoom um, and, and, and take care of your medical business that way. So some examples of these different incentive and facilitation strategies are um, carpool matching and fan pool matching through uh, ridematch.info, which is a, a joint partnership between LA Metro and some of the neighboring counties, um, where they, it's a website that if you go to right now, you can go to ridematch.info, Type in your information where you're starting, where you're finishing, what time you're going, and it'll match you with uh, different folks who are traveling at the same time on the same route and who are also looking to, to save time and money. Um, it's all confidential and it's never closed and it's a joint partnership between uh, Los Angeles Metro, Orange County Transportation Commission, uh, Transportation Authority, and the Ventura County Transportation Commission. It's really just a tool where people can match up to their different transportation options. Um, and then highlighting uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District's alternative work schedule for their own employees. Their employees um, work four days a week, 10 hour days, um, but then they don't commute on those Fridays. So they, they take, uh, they're reducing their employee commute trips by 20%. Um, employees love it because they get three day, they're only working four days a week, um, but they um, are also reducing those uh, commuter trips as well. So that's incentive and facilitation strategies. Did anyone have any questions or thoughts on this? Uh, nothing's come in so far, uh, although I'm hoping you, you made a request Nathan, that people would share. And I know that UCI has some great uh, TDM examples. So maybe if Gustavo later on wants to put something in the chat or raise his hand, uh, we'd love to hear from um, one of our ETCs. Love to hear the work you're doing. We will push on though um, and talk about our third category, which is infrastructure and system upgrade TDM strategies. These are strategies that um, make improvements to make alternative transportation modes more competitive, uh, whether they be physical improvements to infrastructure or more on the policy side of things to make system improvements, um, or they even create a new transportation option. Um, these costs can be a lot more, but the impacts can be a lot more as well. We're a little bit more limited by our implementers on who can actually um, create these, uh, they do implement these strategies, um, municipalities, regional governments, um, anyone who kind of controls infrastructure developers can implement these strategies and you can create a whole new transportation option and really create um, more, more alternatives for folks. Um, but these can be more expensive and, and take time to implement. So I'm talking about things like um, public transportation, making bicycle improvements, um, shared transportation shuttles, um, really integrating different transportation modes, whether it's biking in transit or, or other transportation modes. And then uh, dockless, micromobility, new mobility programs um, are kind of this catch-all for talking about things like um, scooters and bike share, um, 
that, that can also be used to provide new transportation options for folks to uh, try and re replace their car trips. These often require some, some uh, use of the infrastructure. So whether it be um, improving bike lanes to make them safer or creating bus only lanes um, or something similar, um, really only cities or municipalities um, or governments can implement these because you need that kind of right away or infrastructure authority uh, to make these changes. Um, so I'm talking about things like uh, pedestrian scrambles, um, highlighting the city of Long Beach and their um, pedestrian scrambles where they let folks on foot cross diagonally so they don't have to cross, wait, cross. They can just cross diagonally um, is, a, is an example of an infrastructure um, improvement. And then um, LA Metro and the city of LA have uh, just today, they're striping more um, bus only lanes, bus priority lanes. Um, in downtown LA, they already have several of these, um, which is uh, really supporting uh, the, bus, the bus system with some infrastructure on the ground to speed up transit service um, as part of the next gen bus. Line. So that's, that's happening as we speak, I believe. So an example of some of the more system uh, infrastructure upgrades that, that come along with TDM. Um, it looks like uh, maybe somebody typed in the chat, just, um, what, do, what do we got there, Leslie? Oh yeah, so I, I poked uh, Gustavo a little, so he shared with us about uh, incentives and how college students really um, like getting things like bike lights, bike tools, and other other sort of freebies that improve their commute. And that's worked well for uh, increasing bicycle participation at UC Irvine. That's great. Gustavo, can I put you on the spot? if? No pressure um, if, if, you're, if you're not able to, to speak, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, some of your incentives, what, maybe what you found that works or maybe some things that, that don't work. If you had any chance to play around with those incentives, are you able to unmute yourself and, and share a little? We'd love to hear. Uh, definitely. Um, we've seen, of course, as I mentioned, incentives like things that improve uh, their commute, like bike tools or bike lights are definitely things that are you know, incentivizing students and other staff and faculty to commute into work more sustainably, but also um, working with other transit agencies and making sure that we facilitate um, students and staff or faculty to use these other transit methods as opposed to just a single vehicle um, we've seen as has worked. Uh, things that haven't worked, I don't think I've uh, experience something that doesn't necessarily work, uh, but definitely over time I'll experience those. Great, that's that's really interesting, and we're we're, we're so delighted in that work. That, thank you for sharing. Um, I think there's probably a little trial and error period, right, where you know, like, oh, maybe people do like uh, bike lights, but then we've got everybody's got bike lights, and that's not as powerful as a motivator anymore. So, uh, just keeping track of how powerful your incentives are um, can be uh, something that. Change over time. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Appreciate you uh, jumping on there. We're going to press ahead um, and talk about parking strategies. These are strategies that um, we're going to increase the cost to driving alone and parking, whether they be physical costs or time costs. Um, really, we've subsidized driving and parking in Los Angeles County so much by providing um, expensive freeways and uh, ample parking. Um, and really, those, those subsidies and those costs haven't been passed on to the folks using that infrastructure, right? It's largely free to drive, um, but it's not largely free to create all this infrastructure and maintain it. Um, so how do we um, kind of level the playing field a little bit with parking pricing or controlling the demand for parking? Parking is never free. Um, somebody's paying for it, and it should be the folks who are actually taking advantage of it. So um, the costs to some of these strategies are can be middling or higher, uh, but the impacts can be really high. We understand that this is a challenging uh, strategies for, for folks to implement, but the, the impacts can be very high um, around getting people to try different alternative transportation options. Implementers, anyone who can control parking supply, um, developers, employers, cities, municipalities, anyone who really is focused on parking or car infrastructure, um, we're really trying to remove the subsidiz subsidization of parking um, and subsidization of driving to, to help shift that behavior. Um, challenges are, of course, it can be really difficult to build uh, will, political will, to overcome the, the status quo of um, cheap driving. So I'm talking about things like 
parking cash out um, and parking unbundling, similar ideas, but uh, parking, uh, parking pricing is just the charging for people to park. It can be as simple as $1 to park where we're just getting people to pause and think about, hey, is there another way I can get there? Um, or things more like dynamic parking pricing where the price changes depending on how much demand there is. Parking unbundling um, is the idea that we're gonna separate the, chart, the cost of parking from a lease, whether it be a residential or an office lease, we wanna separate the cost of the parking. Sometimes you'll see free parking or you, you get a parking spot that comes with this lease. Um, it's not free, it's built into the cost of your lease. And um, if you get that parking as part of it, if it's combined with it, you're more likely to, to drive. Um, folks are more likely to, to take advantage of that spot. So unbundling that is the idea that we're gonna have a separate cost for the parking and a separate cost for the lease for the building. Um, and really letting people choose if they want to buy the parking spot uh, separately. Parking cash out is a along building upon those same ideas where we're, we're separating the cost of parking from, uh, from a business or for how people are getting around. Um, people have incentives to use other modes if we separate that, those costs out. Parking cash out involves subsidizing alternative modes of uh, transportation um, in lieu of providing um, free parking spaces. And we'll talk about more of that on the next slide. And then parking facility design and curb management is just thinking about when we are designing our curbs, our, our street parking, or our, our structured parking, um, how are we doing that so it's influencing uh, travel behavior? Um, how, we, how can we do this to make sure that um, other modes are competitive as well? So talking about parking cash out, the state of California actually does have a parking cash out law that um, technically applies to many of our employers here in Southern California. It's not uh, enforced um, very much outside of the city of Santa Monica, um, but it does uh, reward employees who choose um, non-single occupancy vehicle, alternative transportation modes, and encourages others to, to do that. Basically, if you're an employee and you're uh, getting a parking spot for free, but it's not actually costing them, but it's actually costing the employer some money, they're subsidizing that cost for that free parking spot for you. The employer has to give that subsidy, that same amount to employees who are not taking advantage of it, who are not driving to work. Um, Essentially, it's a free program for employers. It's either you're paying a lease for this parking spot or you're paying your employee to, to try different alternative transportation modes. Um, but there's a lot of exceptions and uh, asterisks that mean that a lot of folks don't, aren't required to, but it's a good strategy that they can implement. Happy to do a deep dive into parking cash out. It sounds complicated at first, but it's actually really simple. Also highlighting the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles's uh, Express Park program where they have um, meters that use demand-based pricing in some of the uh, uh, more popular areas of the city, uh, downtown LA, Hollywood, uh, Westwood, where the parking spaces pricing changes with demand. So um, when it's slower, the price is lower, and when it's higher, the price is higher, so that um, folks uh, at high demand times are more encouraged to try different transportation. So I'll pause again for questions and for me to grab a drink of water here. Um, Lisa, it looks like Lisa had a comment here. Right, so Lisa's sharing uh, with us that she was also an employee transportation coordinator at the University of Laverne with some bicycle and uh, transit incentives. And I, and I believe Lisa's also working in shared mobility now with Metro. So if Lisa has some, um, the ability to unmute, we'd love to hear from her. Yeah, what kinds of things are you working on in the TDM space, Lisa, or what's your experience in the past? Hi, yeah, um, I was with the University of Laverne for 17 years and I implemented a bike library, which I first saw in uh, Colorado um, and brought, the, uh, brought it back to the University of Laverne. I took um, bikes that were left um, by students over the summer, I refurbished them, I created a bike library, and if a student came back and said my bike was stolen, I would say, what did it look like? Here, I refurbished it, you can have it back. Or if they weren't claimed, I would um, say, hey, you can check out a bike from the bike library, it's free, I'll maintain it, here's a lock, here's a helmet if you want. I had students riding them to work for a semester, to the pool for a day, um, it was their, you know, first means of transportation. So that worked out really well. Um, and pretty soon the word got out and people were donating bikes, which was great. 
Um, I also, in the city of Laverne, I installed on the campus uh, the first bike workstation, which had a stand and tools so that um, you know students, faculty, and staff could work on their bikes um, if they had a flat tire or needed to tighten something up. Um, and then the city also um, implemented a couple more, installed a couple more throughout the city. Um, I worked with Foothill Transit is another good um, incentive. Uh, the university subsidized um, part of the cost so that the bus passes were free to students and faculty. Um, that's something else that's, you know, another entity you can work with um, in your area, um, the local bus routes, uh, bus companies to see if they can, you know, help out students, faculty and staff or employers. Um, so th those are just a couple things. I'm also on the active transportation committee with the city of Laverne. We work on uh, installing um, bike lanes and walk lanes in the city. Um, so it's really neat and it's great to be a part of the uh, Metro now shared mobility team. Um, so I can now help employers and universities uh, with ideas and, and um, you know, to get people around, um, you know, where they need to go. Awesome. So, yeah. Those are some those are some great examples where Gustavo was kind of focused more on the incentive and facilitation strategies, right? Really focusing on those incentives. What you were just talking about are more of these infrastructure and system upgrade strategies for um, getting bikes into, into people's hands and making it easier for them to, to get around by bike and some and subsidization that, um, of transit passes as well. But just kind of showing that there's different kind of strategies and different categories that you can mix and match from. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, Lisa. Um, we're going to move forward because I want to make sure we get into our breakout room so we can kind of share and have some more discussion, um, but I really appreciate those um, uh, inputs. The last category that we have here is our um, TDM supportive policies, and this is kind of a, a catch-all for strategies um, that support TDM, existing TDM strategies, right? So adjacent policies, so things on, that impact land use um, or price congestion, um, uh, or, or really include TDM in the uh, formal planning process um, are all kind of in this category, this hodgepodge of things. Um, my scale is kind of broken here where these can cost a lot or a little and have big or little impact, but um, we're really looking at more municipalities, governments, transit agencies who can implement these strategies. And we're trying to make alternative transportation options more attractive and convenient. Um, they can take a long time to do and we need oftentimes lawmaker or, pol or politico uh, buy-in to implement these strategies. Things like congestion pricing, um, which is uh, can be more like what they do in London, where you have to, to pay a fee to go into the, the congestion central area, or it can be things like toll lanes, like we have here in Los Angeles, express lanes. Um, TOD is really focusing on land use, trans transportation, excuse me, transit-oriented development, really thinking about how we can orient our land use and our communities around our transit hubs. And then TDM ordinances and policy development is talking about things um, like the AQMD's rule or Santa Monica's rule that are requiring folks uh, to implement TDM strategies. So um, I highlighted uh, Rule 2202 that Air Quality Management District is doing here in Santa Monica again. And then I also wanted to highlight Culver City. Um, and they did a TOD visioning study um, where they looked at the area around the Culver City Expo Line, Culver City E-Line station, um, and how they could grow the, the city around the station and make it easy for people to take transit. Um, and I believe there's some uh, implementation happening around that as we speak. I don't know if, uh, I think we had somebody from Culver City, um, maybe we could put on the spot. Is the, is the Move Culver City um, program, do you, are you familiar with that program? Were you able to give us the, the quick highlights from it? Yes, um, I'm actually uh, on the project team for Move Culver City. Um, so this is Caitlin um, with Transportation Department in Culver City. Uh, we're actually doing the construction right now and this is, the, I think, the fourth week into the construction. We're anticipating the launch of the program on next Saturday. Um, so the project itself involves the creation of a bus and bike lane. So um, for the total length of 1.3 miles from essentially the dotted area in this map, uh, from Culver to Kane, all the way to uh, Washington La Cienega Avenue for 1.3 miles. So the idea is that uh, we're converting existing uh, on-street parking or uh, in some segments, uh, it's uh, one existing traveling lane to uh, either a shared bus bike lane or a dedicated bike, bike lane plus a dedicated bus uh, bike lane. Um, and at the same time, uh, the department also 
um, invested and on a local circulator to be launched at the same time for uh, as the, the lane is open. And so the circulator will, which is that, which, which is the route dedicated by that light green light. So the circulator is connecting through the mobility lane um, that connects the downtown Culver City, the E-Line station at Culver City and Culver City Arts District. Uh, so we're trying to um, essentially implementing this idea where we're limiting the space for single occupant vehicle or any private car. And then at the same time, we're, we're providing a high frequency public transit service for this area. Um, so the goal is that it's similar to the, the goal of the entire TDM concept. We're trying to have people shift their mode uh, when they travel to Culver City downtown area or uh, when they access our district and try, um, trying to connect with the local rail station, then um, they don't need to drive their own car. They can take the hop on this frequent circulator and then go to where they need to go. Um, so I think that's the gist of it. And yeah. actually, I will invite uh, all the attendees of this meeting to uh, take a look at movecovercity.com um, and then look at our project and, and potentially even attend our launch event on the Saturday of, I think the second Saturday from now on, so the morning of November 20th. Great. I love a good uh, a plug there. That's awesome. That's such a cool program where Culver City looked at um, their, their, their train station, their, their high efficiency um, way of getting people to the city and said, oh, it's a little farther from downtown. How are we going to connect people um, without requiring them to need a car? And they, they've built the infrastructure. They're building the infrastructure as we speak to connect um, those two things together. So that's really exciting. If you wouldn't mind posting that link in the chat, um, we, I'm sure some folks would love to, to learn more about it. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, that's it for the, the different highlights, highlighting the different TDM strategy categories. What we're going to do now is jump into breakout rooms. And I want to do this quickly so we have some time to chat. We're going to take about 20 minutes um, and you'll be put into a breakout room with a facilitator. The facilitator will kind of run you through a couple of questions. We have a, a worksheet um, that you can, you can uh, guided worksheet that you can kind of get an idea and start filling out. We'll be able to download the, the worksheet. Um, and uh, fill it out later, but it's just a, a place to kind of start the conversation. So um, Pooja, let's go ahead and launch the breakout rooms. You'll have a facilitator, go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll come back in about 15 to 20 minutes and recap it and wrap up the training. Uh, Pooja, are we good to, to launch? Ready to launch, you should be Okay, go ahead and hit down. join. Okay, welcome back everyone. I apologize if you got caught off mid-sentence, um, but thank you for uh, rejoining us here. I want to do um, I'll give Jenny um, and Pooja just to ask for a, a 30 second recap of what you um, talked about. Maybe Pooja, can you go first or Pooja or Zoe, can you give us the 30 second recap of what you guys talked about? Sure. Uh, we didn't get through a lot of our spreadsheet, but um, we talked about uh, how uh, we would like to encourage more people to carpool or vanpool. Um, and especially something that's difficult in a post-COVID environment. Um, and we also talked about how cities can encourage their residents to, uh, to carpool or vanpool more. Um, and then also talked about some really great suggestions on marketing various options um, from pizza and ice cream parties to, <laughs> uh, yeah, to um, using Metro Ride Match as a great resource as well. Wonderful, great. Uh, Jenny, what went on in that group? So we talked about TDM at a larger scale, maybe at the citywide level. Um, how do we, we encourage TDM programs? And, um, you know, um, Caitlin shared that the city of Culver City has a really outdated TDM ordinance. And so a lot of the programs are reviewed or negotiated on a case by case basis. So we just talked through, you know, how um, it could be updated, how it could be much more standardized um, to encourage more um, alternative commuting um, amongst the employees, residents, and visitors um, who go through the city, especially as new programs are being rolled out to make sure that they are familiar with it and are you know, encouraged to um, try it out so that they don't feel like they have to drive to work or anywhere they're going. Great, wonderful. Well, um, thank you guys for, for participating and uh, 
telling us a little bit about your programs and brainstorming some good ideas. We're going to wrap it up here. We've gotten through all of the, the trainings. We've been um, one hour and 55 minutes, so um, we're right on schedule here. Um, I just want to give an opportunity if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask any questions or any reflections, um, anything that we, we didn't cover, anything that we can clarify, uh, feel free to unmute yourself right now and just uh, uh, let us know. We're, we're a smaller group now. Any final thoughts? Nothing's coming in the chat right now, Nathan, but uh, I think uh, we'll wait a second and see if anyone is raising a hand here. Uh, nothing so far. Well, no worries. Um, we are going to be uh, con continually communicating with you. And our next step here is um, I'll be sending an email um, with a, a couple of things. It'll have these slides. So you can go back and reference these slides. It'll have the toolkit that I mentioned, all those different TDM strategies um, will be there as well. And there'll be a feedback survey. So if you think of something that you want to share with us um, later, please do that feedback survey. We have about four minutes left. So um, I think Pooja is going to uh, put the feedback survey in the chat. If you wouldn't mind running through it, we really appreciate it. Um, let's us know how we did, how we can improve in the future. Um, we're also looking for um, topic um, ideas for the, the next set of trainings, those deep dive TDM 201 sessions that are happening um, in 2022. So that's an opportunity to provide um, input on what we do in the future as well. So um, if you wouldn't mind filling out that survey, we'd really, really appreciate it. And keep an eye out for an email from me tomorrow um, with the slides the toolkit and the survey. With that, I'm just gonna say thank you so much. Thank you to Leslie, thank you to Pooja, thank you to Jenny, thank you to Zoe, thank you to Tom and Steve and Jennifer for um, the sky side of things and making this whole operation work. Um, we really appreciate um, um, them making the time to put this together. And thank you to you all uh, for joining us here for, for two hours. Um, I hope this training was useful. We're hoping you are able to take it and build from it um, and uh, that you're not a stranger and you let us know of your success. So. Thank you guys so much for your time and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Keep an eye out for an email for me tomorrow and uh, take care. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.